Hello, I'm Jim Smyrniotopoulos, and today we're going to be talking about dural based lesions, meningioma, solitary fibrous tumor, hemangiopericytoma, and some others. I have no financial disclosures to make, disappointing to me in my bank account. Meningioma is the most common non-glial primary tumor. It's also the most common extraaxial neoplasm. The vast majority of meningiomas have a typical imaging appearance as a homogeneous hemispheric mass with a broad base against the dura, often with hyperostosis, and because they are hormonally sensitive, they occur twice as common in women as in men. Some meningiomas have atypical imaging and yet will be histologically benign. A hemangiopericytoma is a totally different tumor. It's not a meningioma. We begin by documenting the location of the lesion. Is the lesion extraaxial or intraaxial? Again, the most common extraaxial mass is going to be a meningioma. Hemispheric, homogeneous, and broad based on a dural surface. Other extraaxial neoplasms include schwannomas, pituitary adenomas, various cysts pineal germ cell tumors, and gordomas. Here's a typical example of a meningioma. Again, we see the classic hemispheric shape, broad based against the dural surface, widening the subarachnoid space at the margins. We can see homogeneous enhancement. We can see a dural tail at the edge of the lesion, and we can also recognize that there is hyperostosis. I have a hyperostosis reflex not hyperacidic reflux, but a reflex that when I see hyperostosis for an intradural soft tissue mass, I know that that's most likely going to be a meningioma. There are several other dural-based lesions that must be considered. Meningioma, hemangiopericytoma, or solitary fibrous tumor, dural metastasis, granulomatous disease like sarcoid and pachymeningitis, and intracranial hypotension can also cause dural thickening and may in some cases resemble a mass lesion. S some basic facts about meningiomas. They're very common. In fact, 0.3 to 3% of normal adult humans will have meningiomas. There's a distinct female predilection, but remember that one third of the patients are going to be men. They're usually benign and can be resected for cure. And most commonly, they have the typical imaging appearance and typical findings on gross pathology. Hyperostosis is common, the hemispheric shape with broad dural attachment. Most of them have a dural tail. They're sharply demarcated with an extraaxial CSF cleft. They're often hyperattenuating on a plain CT. Most of them have a nonspecific gray matter signal on MR. They have avid contrast enhancement. Increased perfusion with delayed washout, a long mean transit time on MR, and they have two specific peaks on MR spectroscopy. At three Tesla, one at 3.8 ppm, and about half of them have an alanine peak between 1.35 and 1.55 parts per million. Meningiomas, again, represent up to one third of all intracranial primary tumors. They have an annual incidence of approximately six per 100,000 humans per year. They represent a significant number of all intraspinal tumors. They're primary tumors of middle age. This is a very simple calculation. Your current age plus 10 years equals middle age. When we think about primary meningeal neoplasms, we think about meningiomas, which arise from arachnoidal cap cells. There are several different types of this, and we'll go over uh, the different subtypes. We can also have non-meningothelial mesenchymal tumors that may resemble cartilage. They may resemble bone. We have pigmented lesions, and we have non-meningothelial tumors like solitary fibrous tumor and hemangioblastoma. The overwhelming majority of meningiomas, more than 90%, are WHO grade one tumors. This includes several different histologic subtypes, which all enjoy the same good prognosis.
Less than 10% of meningiomas are going to be atypical or anaplastic lesions, which will have a shorter time to recurrence and a higher incidence of recurrence. Solitary fibrous tumors are grade one, choroid and clear cell meningiomas are grade two, and hemangiopericytomas may be grade two or grade three. Papillary and rhabdoid meningiomas are also grade three neoplasms. The benign subtypes of meningiomas include syncytial, fibroblastic, and transitional. Some meningiomas are chock-a-block full of microscopic calcifications. These are samomatous meningiomas. There are some meningiomas that have an excessive amount of interstitial water, which will show up on CT as low attenuation and on MR as high signal on T2 weighted images. There can be metaplastic features. Remember the meninges are the connective tissue of the central nervous system, and they can produce fibrous tissue, osteoid, and chondroid matrix. We can also have myxoid and xanthomatous and pigmented meningiomas, and any of these may change the MR. This table shows the breakdown of which meningioma subtypes are grade one, grade two, and grade three. So what is not malignant for meningioma? I was quite surprised when the pathologist explained to me that invasion of the dura is not malignant. Invasion through adjacent soft tissue planes in other tumors is almost always a characteristic of a malignancy. Invasion of bone is not malignant. Invasion of the scalp is not malignant. But invasion of the brain is going to cause the pathologist to upgrade the tumor to being a WHO grade two or atypical meningioma. What is the cell of origin for meningioma? Harvey Cushing thought it was the dural fibroblast, but it's not. It's the arachnoidal cap cell, the so-called meningothelial cell. And these cells are most numerous in the arachnoid granulations, which are related to the large dural sinuses. And that accounts for the association of meningiomas with involvement and invasion of the sinuses and occasionally obstruction of the sinuses. Let's talk about the imaging and gross pathology appearance of meningiomas. Meningiomas may be globose, on plaque, they can be intraventricular, they can involve the optic nerve, and they can be intraosseous. About 75% of meningiomas are histologically typical. About 75% are radiologically typical on CT, MR, and angiography, but it's not the same 75%. And atypical imaging does not equate with atypical histology. One of the cardinal principles that I learned at the AFIP is that the atypical appearance of a common lesion may be seen more often than the classic appearance of an uncommon lesion. Since meningiomas are so exceptionally common, it is very easy to see meningiomas that have an atypical imaging appearance. The globose meningioma is shaped like a hemisphere growing slowly. It produces a smooth indentation on the cerebral surface and clinically would present with appropriate findings for involvement of that area of the cortex. These are two different patients, but they illustrate how meningiomas very commonly have a CSF cleft, a space separating the tumor from the brain that facilitates neurosurgical resection. Here is another incidental meningioma of the tentorium, again producing a smooth excavation of the cerebellar surface with a nice CSF cleft. This was not an incidental meningioma, and it's a testimony to the slow growth of the tumor that it achieves such a large size before producing clinical signs and symptoms. The on plaque meningioma grows against the inner table of the skull as a flat or carpet-like thickening, like a flatbread. And every culture has some kind of a flatbread. Pancake, crepe, wonton, tortilla, arepa, sopapilla, bola de milo, pita, naan, lavash, and jera. Every culture has one of these flatbreads. You can pick the analogy that you like the best. The on plaque meningioma is often difficult to distinguish from the underlying bone on CT because both are going to be hyperattenuating, but on MR they're going to be very, very different because the bone will have a much lower signal than the overlying meningioma.
In the early days of CT, it was identified that meningiomas are hyperattenuating or hyperdense in the non-contrast scan. This is primarily due to the fibrous tissue, the vascularity, and occasionally from the presence of microscopic calcification. This early CT example from 1980 also illustrates the overlying hyperostosis, a key and critical feature in identifying meningiomas. Samomatous meningiomas, the ones that are chock-a-block full of microcalcification, are much more common in the spine than intracranially, and they often have such a low signal that they can be identified in MR, and they can also be seen on the CT and on a plain radiograph if you just know where to look. The samomatous meningioma are chock-a-block full of these microscopic concentric calcifications, which are called samoma bodies. Any meningioma can have a couple of samoma bodies, but when they're piled up like this, it is called a samomatous meningioma. Meningiomas, again, are typically easy to see. They almost always have very, very vivid uh, contrast enhancement on MR. And again, they can be associated with hyperostosis, which we see here. There have been lots of efforts to correlate MR signal intensity with the subtypes of meningioma. Most are iso-intense to gray matter on both T1 and T2. Lipoblastic or fatty meningiomas and hemorrhage into meningioma can be bright on a T1-weighted image. Hypo-intense on T2 are the densely fibrous meningiomas. And hyperintense on T2 include the ordinary meningioma, but also the microcystic or humid meningioma and the more aggressive angioblastic meningiomas and hemangiopericytomas. So we have a mixture of some good types and some bad types that are hyperintense on T2 weighted imaging. Meningiomas often have intraaxial vasogenic edema. This can be confusing because it may misdirect you into thinking that you have an intraaxial lesion instead of an extraaxial lesion. Intraaxial edema is seen with all grades of meningioma. It's associated with a smaller CSF cleft or space between the tumor and the underlying brain. It's also associated with microscopic invasion or stickiness of the tumor to the brain. And in these cases, resection is often uh, less complete, allowing for the patient to have a tumor recurrence. Here's an example of a WHO grade one meningioma with very extensive intraaxial vasogenic edema. You can see it spreading along the white matter tracks in the characteristic pattern. Again, this tumor was extraaxial. It was anterior to the temporal pole, and it was a histologically typical meningioma. Note that the patient is actually looking towards the tumor. So why do meningiomas have intraaxial vasogenic edema? Let's go over the facts. It's very common, reported in up to 90% of meningiomas. It may be due to vascularity of the tumor. It may be due to parasitization of the cortical vessels. It may be due to mechanical trauma. It may be due to a secretory effect where the tumor secretes evil humors, such as fluid containing vascular endothelial growth factor. But probably it's most commonly due to something that's called transcortical flow. This reflects the fact that slow growth and close apposition of the tumor to the brain eliminates the CSF cleft. The gray matter, which is normally a barrier to the spread of interstitial edema, becomes thinned and stretched. And it can occur with or without infiltration of the brain. So it does occur in uh, atypical grade two tumors, but it also occurs in grade one tumors. And there is a fluid gradient between the interstitial fluid in the tumor and the brain that allows the fluid to be pushed into the underlying brain. So the arachnoid is normally a barrier to CSF. The pia, however, is permeable to water and ions, but it's not permeable to plasma proteins. If the pia is disrupted, then the protein can get into the brain and then that will draw the water from the tumor and that will give you the spreading pattern of intraaxial vasogenic edema. Here's another example of a bifrontal meningioma extending on either side of the Fox cerebri, and we can see how the vasogenic edema is extending along the association fiber tracts and along the external capsule. Notice that the gray matter is still intact with its normal signal intensity. Peritumoral edema is more commonly seen in male patients with meningioma than female. 
it can be related to a peel versus a dural blood supply. But if we actually look at the overall numbers, what we see here is that if the feature you're describing is edema, edema is more commonly seen with low-grade meningiomas, but only because low-grade meningiomas are so much more frequent than the higher-grade meningiomas. The dural tail is a very common feature seen with meningiomas, observed in more than 90% of examples on MR. It's a nonspecific finding that's seen with many other dural-based masses. It consists of curvilinear enhancement and slight thickening of the dura around the margin of the tumor. It consists mostly of reactive and vascular changes. However, a small cuff around the tumor, less than two centimeters, may consist of neoplastic infiltration. So if we look here, the dural tail is shown by the yellow area. There are multiple flow voids in the CSF cleft, and we can also see flow voids within the tumor itself. We can also see here another curious feature observed in meningiomas called pneumosinus dilatans. This is almost a paradoxical enlargement of the air-filled sinus convex towards the tumor. It's a little bit counterintuitive. Here's another example of a dural tail. Again, there's this curvilinear thickening coming away from the edge of the hemispheric mass. This example also demonstrates prominent flow voids within the tumor. Let's resect a meningioma and look at the gross features. In this uh, craniotomy, we can see the meningioma here adjacent to the brain. We're delivering the meningioma through the operative cavity. And if we compare the image of the meningioma grossly, we can see that there is a little cuff of tumor crawling along the edge of the dura. But the vast majority of the curvilinear enhancement that was seen in the MR is reactive changes and not neoplastic infiltration. By the way, don't you think that this meningioma looks like a stake? If we look at the histology, we can see that there are multiple dilated vascular spaces and there is some loosening of the collagen fibers, but there are no neoplastic cells infiltrating the dura. Meningiomas are composed of whorls of spindle cells, which we can see here. So this cavernous sinus meningioma shows extensive linear enhancement along the edge of the tentorium. When we see a dural tail, the differential diagnosis begins with meningioma, but it can be seen, as mentioned earlier, with any dural base tumor and may or may not reflect neoplastic infiltration since it can also be a reactive change. Let's now talk about calvarial changes. Hyperostosis is the most common and most predictive feature seen in meningiomas. Upwards of 90% of meningiomas will demonstrate some calvarial thickening on MR. The cause is unknown, but it's been suggested to be due to the vascular or hormonal effects of the tumor. It's much more common with skull base and on plaque meningiomas, and it may or may not contain tumor invasion. Roughly 30 to 40% of the times, there may be infiltration of the tumor into the bone. This is a dramatic example of hyperostosis in a 16-year-old girl being prepped for surgery, and we have no idea what kind of a hairdo she had to cover up the protrusion on her skull. But if we look at the lateral radiograph, we can see that there is this spiculated hair on end appearance in the calvarium with the widening of the diploic space, but there is also an extension of the tumor into the subcutaneous tissue of the scalp. As mentioned earlier, these features, as ominous as they appear, do not predict a more aggressive histology and can be seen with ordinary garden variety grade one meningiomas. Here's another example of hyperostosis. This has that classic appearance that's often described as ground glass hyperostosis, and this can easily be confused with the calvarial changes that are associated with fibrous dysplasia. So hyperostosis and meningioma does not mean invasion of bone, but can be caused by invasion of bone. It's typically seen with more slowly growing and therefore more benign meningiomas. And in the skull base, the meningioma may invade the bone using the Haversian canals. This is sometimes called an intraosseous meningioma. The differential diagnosis for hyperostosis includes primary bone neoplasms, 
blastic metastasis such as breast, prostate, lymphoma, and pancreatic tumors, Paget's disease of bone, and fibrous dysplasia. So let's look at this 30-year-old man who presented with painless forehead swelling. We can see on the 3D reformation that there is a large bulging area in the forehead in the brow line. And if we look at the cross-sectional imaging, we have bone thickening and hyperostosis that is relatively but not completely uh, homogeneous. We can see that it involves several different but adjacent bones. This is the classic appearance of fibrous dysplasia. So the differential diagnosis for hyperostosis includes fibrous dysplasia, but the meningioma-induced hyperostosis should be associated with a visible meningioma. So looking for an intradural soft tissue mass can be key. This coronal T2-weighted MR demonstrates significant thickening of the diploic space on the patient's left side. When we give contrast enhancement, we can see that there is an intradural lesion, relatively small, but demonstrating contrast enhancement and thickening. This is actually the meningioma in this case. Fibrous dysplasia never has an extra osseous component. So identifying this is key to recognizing that this patient has hyperostosis from a meningioma. And again, if we look at the image here and compare it to the resected specimen, all of this thickening of the bone was a reactive process from the meningioma. Here we see a large bifrontal meningioma with an area of hyperostosis in the region of the cribriform plate. If we look at the sagittal image, we can also see in this case a little mountain of bone, the hyperostosis, and this large hemispheric lesion. This is another image in a different patient showing a subfrontal meningioma. This is a patient that had anosmia, and this is caused by the tumor destroying the olfactory bulbs and tracts. This patient had a history of smelling badly. Not bad, the adjective, but badly, the adverb. Here is another uh, meningioma involving both sides of the fox. Here's a tuberculum cell meningioma that was also associated with a small area of hyperostosis. And again, another image of a small meningioma overlying the sphenoid sinus. This one also demonstrates that curious feature of pneumosinus dilatans. Meningiomas may arise from any location that contains arachnoidal cap cells. They may occur inside the ventricle. They may occur in the dural sheath around the optic nerve. They've been reported in the nasal cavity, and of course, they occur inside the spinal canal as one of the most common intradural extramedullary neoplasms. Here is a patient that has a spinal cord meningioma. We can see dramatic hypointensity on the sagittal T2 weighted MR. We can see on the CT reformation that the lesion is remarkably hyperattenuating. This is not due to samomatous calcification, but rather to osseous metaplasia with the formation of a mineralizing an osteoid matrix. And here's the beautiful gross picture in the same case. Approximately 5% of meningiomas arise within the ventricle. This is most commonly seen in adult patients. Again, with a female predilection, the most common location is the trigone of lateral ventricle. They are always attached to the choroid plexus. They derive their vascular pedicle from the choroidal blood vessels, and they can cause a trapped temporal horn by preventing drainage of the CSF produced there. Again, we have a focal mass producing unilateral enlargement of the trigone of the ventricle surrounding the tumor. There's a little bit of vasogenic edema in the adjacent brain. This does not signify invasion into the brain. And here on the sagittal image, we also see the trapped temporal horn.
Why do we get intraventricular meningiomas? Because we can have these nests of meningothelial cells embedded within the normal choroid plexus. Embryologically, the choroid plexus forms from an invagination of vessels and pearachnoid into the choroidal fissure. Here we see a beautiful example of radiologic pathologic correlation. It's an optic nerve sheath meningioma. The enhancing mass is surrounding a non-enhancing but normal optic nerve. In contrast, this is what an optic nerve glioma looks like. The fusiform mass enhances and we don't see the optic nerve running through the middle of the mass because the mass is the optic nerve. Let's turn our attention to meningiomas in the context of perfusion and angiography. Meningiomas are almost invariably enhancing and hypervascular masses. They have increased perfusion. However, unlike most hypervascular masses, they oftentimes have a prolonged mean transit time with slow movement of contrast through the capillary vascularity of the tumor. They're most commonly supplied by dural branches of the external carotid artery, but may be supplied by peel branches or have a dual blood supply. We'll see in these tumors that they have an increased RCBV and CBF, and we'll be able to demonstrate prolonged mean transit time. Because of their hypervascularity, preoperative therapeutic embolization is oftentimes performed. This may actually shrink the tumor volume by 5 to 10 percent and significantly reduces intraoperative blood loss. Here's a meningioma, and we see on the perfusion imaging that we have a really, really hot tumor with incredibly increased cerebral blood flow, much hotter than many areas of the cerebral cortex. Again, another example of a meningioma dural based with underlying hyperostosis with significantly increased blood flow within the tumor. So if we compare a glioblastoma multiforme on the left side of the image with a meningioma, we notice that in the meningioma we have delayed appearance of the veins and a prolonged capillary phase of contrast enhancement, the tumor blush. In the venous phase, we have persistence of contrast material within the capillaries of the tumor, very different from most tumors that are hypervascular. And we can demonstrate when we look at the curves that there is very slow washout within the tumor. Again, a distinctive characteristic suggesting a meningioma. Again, most meningiomas are supplied by branches of the external carotid artery. Some are also supplied by branches of the internal carotid artery, and the tumor almost always has a distinctive and easily visible tumor blush. Classic appearance here of angiography in a meningioma showing a dilated middle meningeal artery and this radial or spoke wheel arrangement of small vessels within the tumor itself. This spoke wheel vascular pattern is highly characteristic for meningiomas. So what is characteristic about meningioma is a prolonged mean transit time and delayed opacification of the draining veins. Again, very different from most hypervascular tumors. Let's discuss some atypical features of meningioma. These include having the wrong attenuation, i.e. being lucent instead of hyper attenuating, having the wrong signal, being too bright on T1 or too bright on T2, or being very heterogeneous or demonstrating cystic change. The heterogeneous or multi-cystic meningioma may be a histologic variant called the angiomatous meningioma, but this is also seen with solitary fibrous tumors and hemangiopericytomas. Hyperintensity on T1 weighted MRs can indicate uh, fatty metaplasia, the so called lipoblastic meningioma. Hyperintensity on T2 can be seen with secretory or humid meningiomas. We can also identify corresponding 
uh, hypoattenuation in the humid and lipoblastic meningiomas. Here's a classic example of fatty metaplasia or a lipoblastic meningioma. We can see that there is an abnormally low attenuating hemispheric mass with a peripheral rim of hyperattenuation. We can also see that parts of the tumor have the expected attenuation of a meningioma, and there is hyperostosis. The presence of the hyperostosis is key in identifying that this is actually a meningioma and not some other process. Here is a gross picture from that tumor, an indentation in the surface of the tumor produced by the hyperostosis of the bone. And in cross-section, we can see the tumor has the yellowish color of fat instead of that meaty color we saw in the other meningioma that we illustrated uh, talking about the dural tail. The dura here is not infiltrated by the tumor. It has a normal thickness and normal appearance. There's a meaty part of the tumor adjacent to the hyperostosis and a peripheral rim of more meaty tumor surrounding the fatty area of this lipoblastic meningioma. This is the histology from the same case, and we see the classic meningothelial whorls that indicate to the pathologist that the tumor is a meningioma. But in between, we can also see cells with a large amount of intracellular triglyceride, and this is that fatty metaplasia that causes the CT appearance. Here is a humid or watery meningioma demonstrating low attenuation on CT and dramatic hyperintensity on the T2-weighted MR. This also has a little nubbin of the meaty part of the tumor that's adjacent to the bone. That's probably the point of origin of this meningioma. Here is a lesion that mimics the appearance of a cyst and mural nodule except that what we can see on the CT scan is that this lesion is actually extraaxial, displacing the cortical gray matter inwardly. And this is a secondary cyst associated with meningioma. Slowly growing extraaxial lesions, like meningiomas and schwannomas, can produce an acquired or secondary arachnoid cyst. Here is another example of a meningioma with a secondary or acquired arachnoid cyst. Here is a patient that illustrates fluid accumulation inside a meningioma. Tumor necrosis can also create the same appearance. And here is a so-called cystic meningioma. And this is a very heterogeneous lesion. It actually mimics the appearance of a glioblastoma multiforme, except that it appears to be outside of the corpus callosum. Again, this lesion is dramatically heterogeneous, and this was an angiomatous meningioma. That's a more aggressive variant. Let's talk briefly about image-based grading of meningiomas. It's important to assess the tumor for the presence of the CSF cleft, which has important implications for the neurosurgeon, and the absence of the cleft may be a sign of an atypical WHO grade two tumor. MR spectroscopy can be useful in the differential diagnosis for metastatic disease, solitary fibrous tumor, and hemangiopericytoma. Perfusion is important and was mentioned earlier. And decreased diffusion within the tumor has been associated with increased cellularity and proliferation, which may predict a worse prognosis for the patient. There is a lot of disagreement in the literature about the actual value of having a decreased ADC value. Some studies have shown that higher grade tumors have restricted diffusion. Well, that has not been confirmed in every paper. In terms of MR spectroscopy, approximately half of them will make alanine and will show that peak at 1.35 to 155 parts per million. On three Tesla MR spectroscopy, there is a so-called characteristic peak at 3.8 parts per million. And hemangiopericytomas make myoinositol instead of making the alanine that we see in meningiomas. Here's a classic spectrum at three tesla for a meningioma showing the characteristic peaks of alanine and also the peak associated uh, with the glutamate glutamine at uh, 
3.8 parts per million. So let's take an example here. What is this tumor? We see a peripheral hemispheric lesion broad based on a dural surface that has some enhancement, but it has an atypical uh, signal characteristic. Spectroscopy in this humid or watery meningioma demonstrates that the fluid-like area has both the characteristic meningioma peak at 3.88 as well as having the alanine peak. These are both characteristics of meningiomas and would not be seen in other dural-based masses that would be included in the differential diagnosis. Let's turn our attention to solitary fibrous tumor and hemangiopericytoma. These tumors in the past were mistakenly described as malignant or aggressive meningiomas. The 2016 revision of the World Health Organization classification merges the category of solitary fibrous tumor and hemangiopericytoma because they have overlapping mutations in nuclear STAT6. Hemangiopericytomas make myoinositol, which can be a helpful feature on MR spectroscopy, and hemangiopericytomas are more lobulated, more vascular, have a narrow base, and have no hyperostosis in comparison to meningiomas. The solitary fibrous tumor is a grade one tumor and is highly collagenous. The hemangiopericytomas are grade two, or they may be grade three, so-called anaplastic hemangiopericytoma. Less than 2% of meningeal tumors are going to be in this SFT hemangiopericytoma subclass. SFTs and hemangiopericytomas do not have a female predilection different from meningiomas. They're much more likely to have local recurrence and they may have extracranial metastasis affecting bone, lung, and liver. When these tumors are resected, there should be local irradiation to the tumor bed. Typical appearance is illustrated here for hemangiopericytomas, WHO grade two. The left panel demonstrates a mass with a narrow base of dural attachment and very prominent flow voids. The right panel illustrates a lesion that appears to be within the quadrigeminal plate or tectal cistern and a highly heterogeneous lesion reminiscent of the angioblastic meningioma that was shown earlier in this lecture. Histologically, hemangiopericytomas will not show the whorls of spindle cells that we see in meningiomas and instead will show these irregular staghorn vessels. Hemangiopericytomas are much more likely to be lobulated masses, much more likely to have very prominent flow voids, and much more likely to have a narrow rather than a broad base of dural attachment, as is illustrated in this case with two sagittal images. Angiographically, hemangiopericytomas will show a much more complex vascular pattern, and they will not have that spoke wheel vascularity that we've seen in meningiomas. Again, we have a dural based tumor, but instead of being hemispheric, it shows a very lobulated configuration. Both meningiomas and hemangiopericytomas can be transdural, appearing both intradural and extradural, or appearing on both sides of the fox or the tentorium. Here is another example of a hemangiopericytoma, an enormous mass, very lobulated mass with multiple irregular flow voids. Hemangiopericytomas again are less than two or three percent of primary intracranial tumors. They represent a couple percent of uh, dural based tumors and they have a slight male predilection. They never have hyperostosis. We never see calcification or semoma bodies within the tumor, and they tend to be very lobulated instead of hemispheric. Here's another example of a hemangiopericytoma on CT. It is a heterogeneous lesion. It's associated with bone destruction, which however can also be seen in ordinary meningiomas, and it has a narrow base of attachment. 
because the base of attachment is so narrow, it actually appears to be an intraaxial mass surrounded by brain seen in the image on the right-hand panel. There are many other differential diagnostic considerations for peripheral and extraaxial masses, including calvarial and dural-based tumors, as well as metastatic disease, granulomatous disease, Langerhans cell histiocytosis, rosai dorfin disease. Let's talk about some of these differential lesions. Ewing sarcoma, a primary intraosseous lesion. Like a meningioma, it may appear to have a broad base of attachment for a hemispheric mass lesion. This is caused by the attachment of the periosteum to the bone that resists being dissected as the tumor expands. The tumor also has a biconvex morphology for the extracalvarial component on the outside. If we look at the cross-sectional image here, again, we can see the dark line representing the dura separating the tumor from the underlying brain and that bihemispheric configuration. The lesion enhances just like a meningioma. It may also have a nonspecific gray matter signal intensity similar to a meningioma. Multiple myeloma. Multiple myeloma is also going to be tethered by the dura. We can see the dark line here illustrating the dura being dissected away from the inner table of the skull, and it has a very similar appearance to the Ewing sarcoma that we just discussed. Again, we have that same appearance here with persistence of the dark line representing the dura. If we look at the plane radiograph, we can see the classic appearance of a cookie cutter, sharply marginated lesion without reactive sclerosis, typical for multiple myeloma. The lateral radiograph here illustrates multiple lesions consistent with multiple myeloma, again, sharply marginated without any reactive changes in the surrounding bone. So that cookie cutter shape is very typical and characteristic for multiple myeloma. Let's briefly summarize what we had a chance to talk about today with meningiomas. Meningiomas, as we've seen, are the most common non-glial primary tumor. They're the most common extraaxial neoplasm. We saw multiple examples of the typical appearance of meningiomas as a hemispheric homogeneous mass with a broad base of attachment to the dura, oftentimes showing hyperostosis, and because they're hormonally sensitive, they're twice as common in women as in men. We also saw some examples of atypical imaging in meningioma, fatty metaplasia and the humid meningioma. And we finished by talking about the differential diagnosis of dural-based lesions, including hemangiopericytomas, primary and metastatic bone tumors. Thank you very much for your attention.